Uh, Isaiah chapter 24. Father, we thank you for this word. Uh, We thank you for the power of it, the meaningfulness of it, uh, the greatness of what it declares, and the hope that we have for a future uh, based on what we see here and based on the things that you have said. And Lord, knowing that this truly is your word, uh, we place our faith and trust completely in what is declared here. And we pray, Lord, that this would resonate in every heart present, both here in the room and uh, on Facebook Live and live streaming tonight. Uh, Lord, that you would have your way in every heart. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, previous studies, chapter 13 through chapter 23 in the book of Isaiah, uh, we have pretty consistently said as we are studying through those chapters that these chapters, these nine chapters are known of as the book of burdens, and the book of burdens were comprised God's judgment against nations which would destroy Israel, and in the case of Israel being destroyed, they were destroyed by Assyria, and then Judah, and Judah was destroyed by Babylon, so God offered, rendered judgments, and these were envisions given to Isaiah, Uh, against both Assyria and Babylon, that even though God used them as an instrument in his hand uh, to bring down the nation of Israel, take them into captivity, to bring down the nation of Judah, take them into captivity, God pronounced judgment on those instruments that he would use to bring that destruction. So God's judgment against the nations which would destroy Israel and Judah as well as those nations surrounding Judah that they would be tempted to ally themselves with. And if you know the history, if we go back to, to uh, Second Kings and in Chronicles, we see that that is indeed what Judah was trying to do following the fact that, that uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, had been destroyed in 722 and carried into exile by Assyria. The message uh, of chapter 13 through 23 and then just continuing on through all of God's word really is your situation to, to the southern kingdom of Judah now, remembering that Isaiah is prophesying to the southern kingdom. He's got a view of the northern kingdom and what's going on there. And the message that is being declared through Isaiah, through these prophecies, through these visions that God has given him, is your situation, Judah, your situation is hopeless unless you turn to me. Your situation is hopeless Unless, and this is the sad part, this is really sad given the history of this nation, that God would have to say, your situation is hopeless unless you return to me. It's not like they had never been informed. It's not like they had never walked with the Lord. It's not like they had never seen his power and his glory and his might. And thinking back to everything that happened in the desert wanderings and how many times through the book of Judges God brought a judge to save the people. How many times through First and Second Samuel? How many times through First and Second Kings God had saved them, rescued them, performed mighty works on their behalf? And still they had grown cold in their relationship with God and desired to look elsewhere for spiritual things. Kind of reminds me of the United States of America in this day and age. Your situation is hopeless unless you return to me. It's interesting, you know, turn to me, that's not really it. It it is return based on the principles that that nation was founded upon, based on the principles that this nation is founded upon. Your situation is hopeless, and we can see the hopelessness of it. And I think everyone can see the hopelessness of it where we are right now in this nation. Your situation is hopeless unless you return to me. But tonight, if you've read ahead, in chapter 24, now, so we saw God's judgment against those nations, the two nations, Assyria and Babylon, that would destroy both Israel and then Judah, and then the other nations surrounding them geographically that they might turn to for help to ally themselves with against Babylon or against Assyria, Now we see God's judgment against the whole world. And in chapter 24 in the book of Isaiah, we clearly see the tribulation. We see that seven-year period of time that we are waiting for. Um, The 70th week in in the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, this this 70th week that looms large out there on the historic landscape 
yet future. Now we see God's judgment against the whole world foretold 700 years before Christ. God's judgment will be equal against all the Christ-rejecting world. And he says, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface. If you have a King James Bible, it says it turns the, the earth upside down. That's interesting, isn't it, to think about what would happen. We'd go flying off the earth, wouldn't we? No, we wouldn't. We'd still have gravity. That was a trick. (laughs) But given the nature, and, you know, you need to, if you're familiar with the book of of the Revelation, chapter 6 through 19, the tribulation time period that kicks off in in Revelation chapter 6, um, and you, you think about what's being declared here in Isaiah chapter 24, you can't help but see that everything that's spoken of in Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19 is revealed here first. 700 years before Christ, and it just speaks of the consistency of what God's word declares. So behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface, and scatters abroad its inhabitants. Um... Revelation chapters 6 through 19 declare the same sort of thing. And it shall be, and here we're talking about the kind of equality that people are looking for in this day and age, aren't they? Uh, They've employed this new word called equity, and what they're really desiring is equality, and I understand that, and everyone is equal in God's eyes. Uh, I think that we as Bible-believing Christians were probably the first ones to get to that place. And so we see this kind of equality. Is this the kind of equality that the world is seeking? And it shall be, speaking of God's judgment on the whole world, there's not going to be any escape. Um, You know, Bill Gates is not going to get away any more away with his great wealth than a pauper is. Uh, in, In the present day, great wealth seems to command great reputation in all fields, regardless of how it is that you came to your wealth. All of a sudden, wealth establishes you as an expert in every field. And so everyone turns to you, movie star, musician, um, scientist, software developer. Let's, Let's look to that great man because he obviously is a great man because he obviously has great wealth rather than regarding them as somebody who, who came across something that they had a, a great gift or calling in and applied that and accumulated great wealth, but that doesn't necessarily make them an expert when it comes to fighting disease or something like that. But it seems to um, afford that kind of um, luxury in terms of their opinion in this world, but not so with God. When it comes to his judgment, it shall be as with the people, so with the priests. So holy men... Holy men who appear to be holy, they have that position, they have that robe, they're not going to escape the judgment of God. As with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. All equally affected by God's judgment. There's no escape for anyone from the degree of judgment that is going to come into the whole world once this seven-year period of time known of as the tribulation starts. Three and a half years tribulation followed by three and a half years great tribulation. The land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered. How do we know this is so? We know this is so for the Lord has spoken this word. And that's why Jesus, in Luke's gospel, in chapter 21, verse 36, said this, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And he said that same sort of thing to the church at Philadelphia in, that, in, that, in the course of the seven letters to the seven churches. The next to the last letter went to the church at Philadelphia that had a little strength because they had kept... God's word of prophecy, as I pray that that you in this church are keeping, holding, trusting, believing in God's sure word of prophecy, and because they had kept that little strength, 
Um, even despite the way the world is headed and even the, the religious, especially the, the scholarly, religiously um, informed world is headed, the church at Philadelphia decided to stand on God's word, to continue to declare that it was indeed God's word and believing that this will take place. Why? Because God has said it will. And just as everything God has said in the past has come true, we also count on the fact that everything that God has said about the future will also come true. And this is the point of prophecy, isn't it? That we would know where our future is headed and we would know in whom we have believed. The word of the Lord has spoken this word. So the earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people, the prideful of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants, or you could say by its inhabitants. The earth is defiled by its inhabitants. Because why? And what is it truly that defiles the world? And here we have God's accounting of that. And environmentalists think in a certain way, um, ascribing everything to humanity and and uh, all this talk about you know the climate change and all that stuff being ascribed to that 0.002% that man contributes to the atmosphere in terms of, of pollutants. God says what pollutes the world, here's the point, it's because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. You see, it's sin that befouls the world. It always has, it always will. It's, it's not the output of man. But it is interesting to see that as we read through verses 1 through 6, and he says, therefore, the curse has devoured the earth. What? The curse of sin, right? The wages of sin is death. Therefore, the curse has devoured, devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 22, Jesus said this about these days, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And we'll get to that in just a minute, because we're going to see a a remnant come out of all this, this judgment. But How interesting it is to see, and if you are familiar with Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19, how often it is that we see God use the environment as a means of his judgment. And, you know, we see the earth burned up and the rivers running dry and the rivers turning into blood and and that sort of thing through those chapters. And then, you know, the effect of God's judgment on emotions and to uh, remember, we're looking to the future, but we ourselves in our culture presently have an idea of what the future is going to be like because in our culture in this day, we're led by emotions rather than truth. And that may not be necessarily what, what is true of this church or you in this church, and I hope it isn't, but you look outside those doors and everyone is led by their emotions. And every single news story where there's some kind of event especially if it's tragic, but even if it's not tragic, it could be joyful. The news person on the street puts the microphone in the person's face, and what's the question? How, do you, how did that make you feel? How did that make you feel? It's never been that way in the history of mankind that a society and a culture, and it's worldwide. It's not just the United States of America, although I think we're especially prone to it because of our wealth and because of all the leisure time that we have. We're led by our emotions and not by the truth. And we're led by, we're led into sin because we perceive emotionally that something about that lust is going to make us feel good. And so we're led by our feelings rather than the truth of what God's word declares. And God says, I'll show you, here's going to be the effect of my judgment on your emotions. You desire to be led by your emotions? The new wine fails. The vine fails languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh, the mirth of the tambourine ceases. 
You see, when judgment comes, all those people and all those beer commercials that are all talking at once and having the time of their life, they're going to be in horror. There's going to be nothing that that alcohol can do for them when it comes against God's judgment, when it, when it comes to facing. You can't drink your way out of this problem. You can't numb yourself to it. In fact, part of the judgment we're going to see in just a second is all that's taken away. Imagine that. All these people addicted to all these drugs, all these people addicted to alcohol, and all of a sudden that's all taken away in in God's judgment. And we can just imagine all the people screaming. Imagine all the drug addicts in all the world no longer able to get their whatever it is. And the profound effect that it would have on their lives. The new wine fails, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh, the mirth of the tambourine ceases, the noise of the jubilant ends, the joy of the harp ceases. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may go in. Listen to this. There's a cry for wine in the streets. Think about all the alcoholics unable to satisfy their desire, their lust. Think about all the drug addicts unable to satisfy their desire for that drug, that fix, all at once in the entirety of the world. You know, this this crazy investment that we're making in our society in, you know, providing people with with these kinds of substances or not doing anything about the fact that that they're coming, they're flooding into our, our nation and destroying a generation, more than a generation. And some of us in the room tonight are wearing the battle scars of having grown up in a drug culture, wearing the battle scars of having grown up in a drink culture, where, you know, from your earliest moments of of adolescence, it's put in front of you, it's forced upon you, let alone pornography and all the other kinds of of, um, godless influences that this world forces upon people. And now we're seeing it invade our entertainment realm um, to the extent, or actually come from the entertainment realm to such an extent that now it's flooding into the, the last sort of bastion of um, relaxation for those seeking entertainment from this world, apart from this world, and that is the, the now political invasion into our sports fields. And there's no escape from the opinions of, you know, whoever, even there. Uh, the, the baseball field and the football field and the basketball court used to be relatively peaceful places where you could go for escape for a while. But not anymore. Now you're confronted. It's in your face. It's written on the courts. You can't turn away from it. Here it is. Um, you're going to get it no matter whether you want it or not. We're going to force it on you. And this is what is being spoken of here. And God says, you know what? I'm just going to take all that away. I'm just going to remove it all. And the people are going to be screaming. There's a cry for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened in this judgment. The mirth of the land is gone. In the city, desolation is left, and the gate is stricken with destruction. But still in all, as I promised a moment ago, and as God promises, there will be a remnant, and get this, there will be a remnant of Israel. Uh, All those people who believe in replacement theology, uh, case in point of the, the church replacing the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel seemingly disappeared, especially up until 1948, so in 1948 there was sort of a reckoning in that theological viewpoint. But literally what's spoken of here is a remnant of the Jews preserved. We, know, we understand that we are talking about future times. We are talking about the tribulation. And so when we read, when it shall be thus in the midst of the land among the people, it shall be like the shaking of an olive tree. So we begin to describe what a remnant is like. And some of you might have seen some of the harvesting methods that are used, especially pertaining to olives when they're ripe. They, they used to do it by hand, or they'd, they'd take a 
big rod and they'd beat the trees and the owls would fall. And now they sort of grab the, the stump of the tree and they just give it a good shake, you know, and all the olives fall to the ground. But not all do. There's a remnant of olives that are clinging to the branches. And it shall be like that, the remnant of the Jews. It shall be like the shaking of an olive tree, like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. Same sort of thing. They go through there picking all the grapes, whether it's mechanized or whether it's done by hand. You can't get them all. You miss some. And that describes what the remnant will be like. A small percentage, right? Very small percentage, and yet a remnant nonetheless. And it's not the church that he's speaking of. It's the Jews who shall come to know Jesus Christ during the time of the tribulation. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Therefore, glorify the Lord in the dawning light, the name of the Lord God of Israel, in the coastlands of the sea. Um, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, Jesus also spoke of this remnant of the Jews Beginning at verse 15, Jesus had said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, this is at the midpoint of the tribulation, when the Antichrist declares himself to be God and demands to be worshipped by the Jews. Now, up until this point, the Jews have been placing their trust in the Antichrist because the Jews, even to this day, have said and are saying that they will recognize their Messiah. He will be the one that allows them to rebuild the temple. That's what the Antichrist is about. He comes on the scene, he's a great political operator, he's a great orator, he seems to have the ability to bring um, disparate sides together, the Jews and the Muslims um, together uh, to allow them to build their temple on the Temple Mount. There's presently this day enough space on the Temple Mount for the, for the temple to be built. Uh, many people, including myself, those of the Temple Institute, believe that the actual literal location of the temple when it was destroyed is a little bit north of the, the Dome of the, the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and there is room there. Revelation, the book of Revelation seems to indicate that, that the temple will be built on the Temple Mount alongside the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and that there'll be a wall built there. And when John is commanded to measure uh, that land, he tells them not to measure the land that is given over to the Gentiles. Just measure this, this space where the temple is. And, and so the Antichrist comes along, signs this covenant to allow this temple to be built, and then he comes into the temple. By the way, they say that the Temple Institute says they can rebuild a temple in something like a year. And they have all the implements ready to go, and even locating, genetically speaking, the the, uh, the red heifer, the perfect red heifer, without a, you know, there's not a white hair on that, on that, uh, that steed. So, um, I guess a steed is a horse, but uh, that bovine, that bovine creature, um, hearkening back to my grandfather's dairy farming days. So, they're all set to go. All they need is the man to appear on the scene that will allow them to go. And so when that man shows up on the scene and says, yeah, you can build a temple, that's our Messiah. That's our Messiah. Even though he fulfills nothing in their biblical prophecy. See, only Jesus fulfilled biblical prophecy about who the Messiah would be. And we have been over many of those prophecies on previous occasions, but if the Messiah is not Jesus, and this is, a rhetorical statement that I'm making here, um, bordering on the ridiculous. If Jesus is not Messiah, then no one else can be because only Jesus fulfilled the prophetic record contained in all of the Old Testament pertaining to who the Messiah would be. Every last one of those prophecies he fulfilled. And so we have this um, remnant now that... Jesus is speaking of, therefore, he's speaking to, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist comes into the temple, declares himself to be God and demands to be worshipped, well, that's too much even for the Jews, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let him, this is specific to the Jews, 
This has nothing to do with the church. Do you see that? So this is specific to the Jewish remnant. In the time of the tribulation, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. See, that's, that's not us. That's not the church. The church is out of here by then. These are the Jews that are left behind who had come to faith in Jesus um, just after this time. For then there will be a great tribulation after this abomination of desolation. There will be a great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, as we said a minute ago, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved but for the elect's sake, talking about the elect Jews, those days will be shortened. This applies only to the, to the Jews. We can be thankful, all you born-again Christians are we's. I is a we and you is a we. We can be thankful, so thankful, that the rapture of the church comes first. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, we just kind of studied through the books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, we read this, For God did not appoint us, speaking of the church, speaking of born-again believers. We're not talking about the church in general. We're talking about born-again believers in the church, those who have placed their faith and trust in the grace of Jesus Christ for salvation, that have believed in, in their heart that God raised him from the dead, that have confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. For God did not appoint us, we, to wrath, his wrath, the enemy's wrath, yeah, we're wide open to that, spiritual attack, but not God's wrath. And God's wrath is going to supersede the enemy's wrath in capacity, in power, in demonstration. There won't be any comparison. For God did not appoint us to wrath, we're his bride. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, that's what we're appointed to, is to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll be out of here. For the Lord will come on the clouds, and we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air when the last trump sounds. We can be so thankful that the rapture comes first. Why? Because from the ends of the earth, Isaiah 24, 16, from the ends of the earth, we've heard songs, glory to the righteous, but I said, I'm ruined Woe to me. See, there's no escape anywhere in the world. I'm kind of picturing the globe here, as you can imagine it. Spin it around. There's no escape anywhere on the face of the earth from, from God's judgment. But I said, I am ruined. Ruined. Woe to me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Indeed, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Remember in uh, Revelation chapter 6, in, in verse 6, when we see that the, the famine comes on the land, what happens? Well, there are those that are right there to take advantage of it. Um, Revelation chapter 6, verse 6 says, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine, the wealthy exploiting the famine to gain more and more wealth. I uh, read online, I think it was this morning, it might have been yesterday, that online places of business have gained $900 billion from the suffering of the people through this past year. And what we have seen here, Florida has some pretty strict laws against price gouging when a hurricane comes and everybody needs gas at the same time and everybody needs motel rooms and they're in short supply because if you remember the days of Irma when the whole state evacuated, that was, that was a, a trip, wasn't it? Trying to get gasoline. Um, and, you know, even in the coronavirus, when it started out, I, I, I still don't get this, what toilet paper has to do with, with um, 
But it did, didn't it? And, you know, to think about if price gouging had been allowed and you could have figured out a way to hoard some of that toilet paper, you could have sold it for a pretty penny, you know? Um, and that's the kind of thing that's being spoken of here and in the book of the Revelation. You can be sure that when the crops are burned up and when all these environmental um, events, cataclysmic events, uh, begin to unfold, that things are going to be in short supply. And what we've learned about gasoline is that it's always in short supply. There's never enough gasoline if everybody shows up at the gas pump on the same day at the same time. It's it's impossible to meet that demand. There's no way. The supply lines don't run that thick. And so we've already experienced that, imagined that, for years and years through the, the course of the tribulation. And so fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, both figuratively and literally. Because you're talking about a hellish existence. And a hellish existence in which, you know, in that time, um, the pit is going to be open, the abuso is going to be open, and they're going to come out like locusts, and they're going to plague the people. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabited of the earth, and it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who comes up from the midst of the pit, that abuso that's spoken of in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And, and you know, people think about what... What is this pit? What is this abuso in the Greek? And it means a bottomless pit. And, you know, the only way that you could have a bottomless pit, um, geometrically speaking, is if it was at the center of a sphere. And so I, like many other people, I'm not that smart, but I think I understand the concept that the only way that you can have a bottomless pit is at the center of a sphere. I kind of agree with that. Now, one of the places that we visited when we were in Israel was at, at Caesarea Philippi. And when we were at Caesarea Philippi, there was this geological figure there um, called Gates of Hell. And the reason it was called the Gates of Hell was because it was this rock cave that went in, and then it went down. And no one ever has measured the bottom of that pit. They haven't, they haven't discovered it. So actually, that pit is so deep, and it's large. It's probably 30, 50 feet in diameter or something like that. Big opening. Um, and we were right outside of it doing Bible study. And that was the place where Jesus said that the gates of hell, that, that, geographic, that geological formation is called the gates of hell. That's the name of it. And Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the rock of, of Peter's faith. As Peter declared his faith in Christ, um, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, who do you say that I am? And upon that rock, he would found his church. The rock of what? The rock of faith. And what did he say? The gate, while he was right there, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I don't know what you think of when you think about the gates of hell or what that might look like, but try to imagine that cave there at Caesarea Philippi. Um, could that be the place? Well, we can't find out now because that pit is so deep and immeasurably deep that they, they sealed it off so no, no one would fall in there. And is, is there a physical place on the face of the earth? Is that it? Could there be another place on the face of the earth that is that bottomless pit? Yeah, I, I think there is. I, I think what the Bible says is literally true when it comes to this, this bottomless pit. And so um, thinking about this, this pit and what's going to come out of it when the foundations of the earth are, are shaken, that you know, the windows from high on high are open and the foundations of the earth are shaking. Thinking about those um, ecologically powerful events that are going to take place through the course of the years of the tribulation. Imagine, you know, thinking about the foundations of the earth being shaken. And imagine, you know, we have earthquakes in California earthquakes in 
gosh, some strange places lately. You know, the, the increase in the, the birth pack, massive earthquakes in, in Italy, um, earthquakes in Japan with the tsunami. Imagine the entire world quaking at once. You know? That's what's being described. Incredible. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. Um, there's a, a place in Revelation chapter 8 where it says this. Then the second angel sounded, speaking of the trumpet judgments, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. We're talking about worldwide, and imagine something like the size of a mountain being thrown into the sea and the impact that that would have on the earth. And the earth would be shaken, violently broken, split open, shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. And we, you know, we've talked about this before, that the earth is a sphere and it's spinning at a thousand miles an hour. And if you spun a top at a thousand miles an hour and it somehow lost that inertia, and we don't really know what the cause of the inertia that keeps the earth spinning is, do we? We can only observe that it is spinning. It's spinning a thousand miles an hour, 24 time zones around the circumference of the earth. Imagine that earth, what happens to a top that's spinning when it slows down just a little bit? And they've already discovered, scientifically, if you can trust science anymore, that every so often, I think it's every 11 years, if I remember correctly, that the earth actually wobbles a little bit. And then for some unknown, imperceptible reason, it picks up speed again before it falls out. Maybe it won't pick up speed again during the time of the tribulation. Who knows? So the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass, and here's that familiar phrase, in that day that the Lord shall punish on high the host of exalted ones and on the earth the kings of the earth. We do not war against you know, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the organization of the enemy's kingdom, the the fallen angels, the demonic realm, all of that. And the Lord is going to bring judgment against that, the host of those that exalt themselves and the kings of the earth. They'll be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in, in what? In the pit. Again, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, that, that angel comes and takes Satan and his, you know, angel and cast them into the pit. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, one angel, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So he's going to come back at the end of the millennial reign. Why? To deceive those who will be deceived. See, you, you have to make a profession of faith in the Lord. It's hard to imagine, but it's hard to imagine anybody turning against God today as well, isn't it? So as the prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison, after many days, they will be punished. You can read about the, the judgment of God in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10, where we read this about that judgment that is to come. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are 
in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Yeah, that's worth a cheer. (laughs) (laughs) Then the moon will be disgraced. This is where the prophet Joel in chapter 2, verses 31, 32, talks about that, that blood red moon, the atmosphere veiling the moon. So many people have gotten excited about through some books lately. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed, refused to shine. And the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. And then we go into chapter 25 and we see this depiction of, first we have the tribulation, now we have a depiction of the millennial reign. Remembering this is all 700 years before the time of Christ. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you, I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. So this is the time period when we come back, we've been raptured, now we come back with Jesus to rule and reign for a thousand years on the earth along with those who survive the tribulation. We read about those people in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. All of this pointing to the the places in the New Testament where we have these discoveries and just thinking about the consistency of God's Word. For you've made a city a ruin, a fortified city a ruin, a palace of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Thinking of, of Babylon... Nineveh, perhaps? Therefore, the strong people will glorify you. The city of terrible nations will fear you, for you have been a strength to the poor. And this is God's way, isn't it? And we have a hard time perhaps believing that when we look out at all the poor people on the face of the earth to think that, that God has his eye on those who are mired in poverty, but he does. For you've been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy, in his distress. And then he says, a refuge in the storm, a shade from the heat. Now you'd have to live in a desert climate to really understand the importance of that, that shade from the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. You will reduce the noise of aliens as heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadow of a cloud. I love this. The song of the terrible ones will be diminished. So all these entertainers with all this demonic presentation taking it upon themselves, all these, these reprehensible songs that we have adapted and adopted in our culture, all that's going to be, it's just going to be cut off. It's going to be silenced. It's going to be brought low. It's going to be diminished. Brought low is, is what it says in the King James Version. Um, humiliated is another way of looking at that word diminished. Humbled is another way of looking at that word diminished. When Jesus shows up on the scene, all these entertainers that are disgustingly portraying the lust of the flesh and, and appealing to the lust of the flesh, even as they... I can't figure this out. Even, even as they plea for equality of women and then doing those kinds of things that used to be considered what made women sexual objects, it, it makes no sense. But that's the way it is with the enemy. Nothing, nothing the enemy ever does makes any sense. It's never logical. It is always the basest um, appeal to the lust of the flesh. And if he can get you headed in that direction, um, sin is a hard master. And and just bit by bit by bit by bit. And, And that's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 to take every thought captive and not fall prey to the lust of the flesh. Not even a little bit. 
Give him an inch, he'll take a mile. In this mountain, now we're talking about Mount Zion from which Jesus will reign when he comes back. The Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the lees. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 29 has this to say about this. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, we read, at the last supper, Jesus said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And this is a fulfillment of that. And we remember when we were studying through 1 Thessalonians, the depiction of the Galilean wedding and the betrothal ceremony when the potential groom would declare that to his bride and take the cup and that would be the sign that that betrothal had been entered into as a, as a contract, as a binding contract, that uh, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's house. And that would take place when the wedding feast took place. Uh, it's a beautiful picture, if you remember what was depicted for us in that Galilean wedding ceremony. He will destroy on this mountain. We read in Zechariah chapter 14, and Jesus comes back to um, the mountain, the Mount of Olives, and it splits in two. Amazing things happen. The surface of the covering cast over all the people. And what's being spoken of here is when Jesus comes back, that willful blindness, that, that people who refuse to see the Lord, that people who refuse to see righteousness or to seek after righteousness, all that's going to be stripped away. All those people saying, that have been saying all their lives, using it as an excuse to enter into a, a lustful life, a lust-filled life, a, a sin-filled life, a depraved life, all those people using that excuse, well, if God was real, sh just show himself, you know, stick his face in between the clouds and, and, you know, come into our realm so that we can see him. And of course, that's exactly what he did in the person of Jesus Christ. But we don't want to believe in Jesus Christ because we want to keep doing the things that we want to do to fulfill our lusts. And so we'll have no part of that. Well, all that willful blindness is going to be stripped away when Jesus returns. And there will be no excuse. And that's what's said here. That, that veil that is spread over all the nations, it's going to be removed. Everyone, every eye will see Jesus when he comes again. And every mouth will be stopped. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be wonderful. And he will swallow up death forever. Where did, where did Paul get what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, do you think? Paul was a, a student of, of God's word in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, it's probably one of the most beautiful things that you can ever read um, pertaining to a a memorial service, if someone will say, how are the dead raised up, and, and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 35. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another kind of flesh of animals, another kind of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and there are terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. 
However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of the dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, speaking of the, 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 uh, the rapture of the church. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Where was it written? Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? This is from Hosea, this part. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he will swallow up death forever, and this will sound really familiar as well. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will take away every tear. The rebuke of his people he will take away from, from all the earth. And you know, it's interesting that, and it is true that the Lord, I'm one of his people, you are his people. The Lord rebukes us, doesn't he? He does. I hope he does. He's, you know, part of what you come for is a heap and helping of conviction every time you come to this church, right? That's what you're expecting. I'm expecting to be convicted and rebuked and changed and, and, and made better by the power of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit bringing conviction into your life. That, that's no longer necessary when Jesus comes back to rule and reign because we, when we see him, we'll be like him. Those of us who are born-again believers, that we're gonna have that same kind of, of body that he has that is gonna be really cool, that moves at the speed of thought. That's faster than the speed of light, by the way. And can go through walls and just show up, you know? You're here, knock, 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 you know? You're already there. It's gonna be amazing. So the rebuke, the, the conviction process, when we're in these perfected bodies will, will no longer be necessary. We won't have that, that spiritual warfare. We won't be prone to the temptation of the enemy. He will take away all the earth uh, from this, the rebuke. He will take away, the rebuke of his people, he will take away from all the earth. How do we know this is so? For the Lord has spoken. Boom. And it should be said, in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. From this mountain, the hand of the Lord will rest, and Moab shall be trampled down under him. Um, Psalm chapter 2, speaking of this returning king and his reign upon the earth, Psalm chapter 2, beginning at verse 8, wonderfully says this, Ask of me, and I will give you the nation, speaking of Messiah, the Father speaking to the Messiah, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him." And when he comes back to rule and reign in the Kidron Valley, the blood will flow up to the horses' bridles, it is said in the book of the Revelation, as straw is trampled down for the refuse heap, and he will spread out his hands in their midst as a swimmer reaches out to swim. Imagine the vision that, that Isaiah had speaking in this colorful language, and he will bring down their pride. And that's what God hates the most. And that's what caused Satan to fall. That's what caused his son to die. Pride of man. 
refusal to worship the Lord. He will bring down their pride together with the trickery of their hands. What a day. Can you imagine living in a time, and we will, so we should, when all deception will cease? And how will we know that all deception will cease? Well, for a thousand years, the enemy is going to be locked up in the abuso. Now he's going to be let out at the end of that thousand years, and he's going to seek to deceive those who will be deceived again. But for that time period in which Jesus rules and reigns on this earth, no deception, because he's the father of lies, Jesus said. Satan is a liar and the father of it. All deception, no matter how great or how small, emanates from Satan. Whenever you tell a lie or whenever you're being lied to, you know the source of that. Don't be a source of lies. Don't be a source of deception. We can easily be manipulated by the fiery darts of the evil one. All it takes is a sort of a selfish thought. You know, I can, I can preserve myself or I can, I can make this business deal. All I have to do is twist it a little bit. You know, and, and lies can be by commission. They can be by omission. What's not said sometimes is equally as important and necessary as what is said. So the trickery of their hands, the business dealings, all that stuff, it's all going to be done away with. The fortress of the high fort of your walls he will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground excuse me, I bring to the ground down to the dust. And uh, just parallelism, read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, and you'll see this taking place in the way that Jesus speaks of what's happening here. So let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the glory of your declared word and the the meaningfulness that it has to us because it speaks of our future and it speaks of this one that we love, that we have invested our entire lives in, who is going to come uh, to rule and reign and that we enjoy uh, the prosperity, the, the promise of coming and ruling and reign with you. And, and Lord, we can't, we can't figure that out, out in our minds how that's gonna happen but we do know the necessity of being prepared for that promise, and, and we know that that necessity begins with being born again. We know that necessity begins with placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. So tonight, having seen what's plainly declared in God's word, and perhaps up until this point, as we continue in attitude of prayer, there, there always has been this veil over your eyes, whatever it is, your, your churchianity experience where, where none of these things are ever exposed uh, before you or explained to you. Well, now you've seen it plainly, and that veil has been, has been torn. In fact, when Christ died on the cross, the, the, the veil was rent. And how interesting it is that People who practice religion down through the ages have done their dead level best to sew that veil back up and exclude you from a relationship with God. But what's being revealed here, that veil has been removed. You are without excuse. God wants to be in relationship with you. Will you have him for yourself? He loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die to pay the price for your sins that that might happen. And that's why that veil was torn. Now you don't have to be a high priest once a year. You can be you. You can be you just as you are that, that come to Christ and he will cleanse you. Turn and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me lead you in a word of prayer if you desire to take that step tonight, whether you're here or out there watching online. If you want to commit your soul to Christ, your eternal life to Christ, that all of your sins will be forgiven by Christ and that you will be indwelt by his spirit and become a born again follower of Jesus Christ, then pray these words with me. Very simple words, and it's the attitude of your heart that saves you, not these words, but these words confirm by your ear the attitude that you have in your heart toward the Lord. And so we offer these to the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray these words with me if you will. Lord Jesus, I open my heart and I invite you inside. 
to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to be my God, and to be my friend. Wash me clean, I pray, of all of my sin. For I have decided this night to follow you, Jesus, forever and ever. And I really mean it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.